Hello, my name is Erica Podest, and this is the second webinar of the SAR webinar series. The focus of this presentation is SAR processing and data analysis. So this presentation will be focused on using data from the European Space Agency's Sentinel-1 satellite, which has a C-band SAR. Its satellite is currently operational and the data is freely available. And the SAR processing steps uh, learned here can be applied to other SAR data sets. So the learning objectives are to understand Sentinel-1 data, learn what are the necessary pre-processing steps, and uh, we'll do a little bit of data analysis. In order to meet those learning objectives, I'll provide background about Sentinel-1 data and show you how to access, open, and display the data. We will go through the necessary pre-processing steps and then do a small analysis where we'll be identifying open water from everything else. So we'll start with the Sentinel-1 background. This table shows the characteristics of several SAR sensors and the column highlighted in green is what you should note. This contains a summary of the characteristics of Sentinel-1. Uh, as mentioned, this is a C-band SAR with either a VV and VH or HH and HV polarizations. It depends on which mode you're using, which we'll cover next. So it's important for you to know that there are two, sat two Sentinel-1 satellites in orbit, and they both have the same sensor characteristics. So one is Sentinel-1A, which was launched in early April 2014. And the other one is Sentinel-1B, which was launched two years later in late April 2016. So each satellite has a 12-day temporal repeat. And the two, therefore, provide a six-day temporal repeat. The Sentinel-1 data can be freely accessed online. So Sentinel-1 has four different modes of acquisition. The first mode is the extra wide swath mode, and that's primarily for monitoring oceans and coasts. It has a 400 kilometer swath and a spatial resolution of 25 by 40 meters. Then there is strip mode, which is special order only, and that has an 80 kilometer swath, five by five meter spatial resolution. Then there's a routine the wave mode, which uh, routinely is routinely collected for the oceans, and that has a 20 kilometer swath, five by five meter spatial resolution. And then finally, we have the interferometric wide swath, which does, uh, has routine collections for, over land, has a 250 kilometer swath, and a spatial resolution of five by 20. So how do you access the Sentinel-1 images? There are two ways to access Sentinel-1. One is through the Alaska Satellite Facility, and the other one is through the European Space Agency portal, the Copernicus portal. Uh, for both, you have to register in order to be able to log in. But again, uh, once you register, the data access is free. So there are three levels of data. One is the level zero, the other one is the level one, and the other one is the level two. So the level zero is the raw data, which needs to be decompressed and processed. Level one is produced as SLC or GRD. So the SLC product preserves the face information. So if you're doing something like interferometric SAR, then you want to use the SLC product. And uh, there will be a webinar just focused on interferometric SAR, also known as INSAR, and that's going to be the last webinar of this webinar series. The GND is product is projected to the ground range using an Earth ellipsoid and is multi looped So the phase information is lost in the GND product. 
Then uh, you've got the file name, uh, which contains important information about the characteristics of the file. And it's a very long file name. But if you want to uh, know uh, when your image was acquired, you just need to look at the file name to infer that sort of information. So it gives you information about uh, whether it was obtained by Sentinel-1A or 1B, uh, the swath type, the product type, polarization, day of acquisition, day and time of acquisition, orbit number, file extension. Uh, so all of that, and that's why it's so long. The Sentinel-1 toolbox is a free and open source software developed by ESA for processing and analyzing radar images from the Sentinel series of satellites, including Sentinel-1 SAR, and SAR data from other satellites as well. So the tool includes tools for calibration, speckle noise, terrain collection, mosaic production, polarimetry, interferometry, data analysis, and classification. So it's a really, really great source, uh, resource, and it's a very straightforward to use. And we'll be using the Sentinel toolbox in this exercise. It can be accessed through the link provided here. And it's also free of charge. So the next part will cover accessing, opening, and displaying SAR data, Sentinel SAR data. So first of all, the, as mentioned, you can access the data uh, through the Alaska Satellite Facility or through uh, the ESA Copernicus portal. In this example, we'll be using the Alaska Satellite Facilities uh, data portal. And so you copy this link, and we'll go to the data portal. OK, so we'll go to the Alaska Satellite Facility data portal, and this is what's going to pop up. So you select a search by geographic region. And here in option two, you'll enter the coordinates that were provided in the PowerPoint chart. So this is the area of interest. And this area of interest is located in the Amazon. It's around the city of Manaus, which is a large city in Brazil, in the Brazilian Amazon. So you'll input that in, just copy and paste. And then you'll do a uh, you'll define the dates of interest, and that would be from April 25th, 2015, start date, through April 29th, 2015, end date. And then finally, down here, you specify which data set you're interested in. So we'll select Sentinel-1A and Sentinel-1B. However, uh, note that there is a list of other SAR data sets here available in case you are interested in using data sets that were co collected in the past. So you've got not only the name of the radar data set, right, but you've also got the, uh, the, the range, the, the time range, right? So SMAP, uh, there's UAVSAR, which is an airborne sensor over select areas around the world. There's ALOS Pulsar data collected from 2006 to 2011. They all have different uh, characteristics, so you'll have to uh, go and, and look at uh, how these different sensors are characterized. But it, this is a really great resource for those interested in using SAR data uh, from uh, the past. OK, so we'll select Search. And when you select Search, you'll come up with uh, the results here. And it says that it found three results for our area of interest and our a time frame of interest. And these are the three images that it found that somehow cover that area of interest. Right. So if you put your cursor over the thumbnail here, you can see on the display uh, which image that belongs to, which area that belongs to. So this image is the, the bottom one. This is the middle one. And then if you click on it, you'll find more information, more specific information about the image. So we just clicked on the middle image, and you can find details such as the date of acquisition, 
the beam mode, uh, the, the path frame, ascending or descending, uh, that's very important to always keep into account whether it's ascending or descending uh, because the viewing geometry uh, is different whether the path is descending or ascending and you always want to treat these separately um, especially if you're doing something like a multi-tempo analysis you'll want to for example run classifications on descending or ascending images separately and then compare the final results all right, so it tells you the polarization uh, frequency at C band. And uh, one thing that uh, you'll probably want to select with uh, Sentinel, depending on whether you're interested in, in different types of land cover applications, you want to go with the IW um, images. Okay? And you also want to go with the ones that are already in ground range, so GRD, HD. So you'll download this image, okay? Uh, and note that it's quite large. It's one gigabyte, so it might take a while. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you don't have the capability here in, with this tool to do the processing on the cloud, so you have to download the images onto your computer. Okay, so once you have it downloaded, then you go ahead and you open uh, your Sentinel toolbox. And you just click on the icon, on the Sentinel toolbox icon, it says Snap, to open, to launch the application. And you go to File, Open Product, and you select the file that was downloaded. It's usually, you have to check the default on your computer where your downloads go. Um, it might go to your download folder or your desktop or wherever you've specified. So here, this is the file. One thing to note is that you don't, do not want to uh, open up the zip file uh, previously, okay? So you don't want to uh, uncompress the zip file. Just tell the Sentinel toolbox where that zip file is and it'll take care of uh, decompressing it, okay? So you just select the .zip file and you open, okay? So that file is now open here on the very top. All of the files that you process and open will be placed here in this window called Product Explorer in the top left on the very top. Okay, so if you open uh, that file, it's got a, a number of different directories in there. And if you wanna, for example, uh, find more details about your data set, you open up the abstracted metadata file, which contains lots of information about that specific file. Uh, lat corner lat longs, uh, it's a des descending path, polarization, uh, resolution. So it's, if you want to know extra information about your file, uh, you can obtain it here. And if you want the whole range of inf detailed information about your file, you open up the original product metadata. But the important thing is the actual data itself. So we'll close this and we'll open. So we've got two polarizations. We got uh, BV and VH. So let's open up the BV. Okay, so that is our image and we had talked about speckle in the previous webinar and you can really appreciate speckle here that's that graininess effect that you can see uh, in the image and we'll take care of that through multi-looking but uh, just uh, you, you can see uh, just visually you can see uh, the flow of the river the delineation of the river which are the really dark areas 
Uh, you can see some very bright areas as well and uh, different tones representing either high biomass forest or areas of low biomass, probably deforestation or grazing lands. Okay, so so uh, one thing to note is that we do have uh, two bands. One is intensity and the other one is amplitude. So intensity is the amplitude squared. That's all. And one thing to note as well is that the image is inverted. And that's because it's oriented in the same way that it was acquired. And you can really appreciate this if you go to world map. So down here, you have a series of windows. And there's one called world map. If that doesn't pop up, you can open it by going to the menu on the top, selecting view, selecting tool windows, and selecting world map here and I'll open this window. So what World Map does, it's a Google type uh, display that shows uh, where your image falls uh, in, uh, within the display. Okay, so that's the coverage of your image. And this here is the city of Manaus, this, this point right there where I'm pointing on my cursor. So note, the orientation of the river, right? So that's the actual orientation. And note how it's oriented here. And that's what I meant uh, by the image being inverted. And we'll correct for that when we do the terrain correction. We'll actually put it onto the, its, its uh, correct orientation. So, So the next thing that I'm going to show you is how to display the image as an RGB. And for that, we'll go to uh, the actual image. We'll click on the image. And uh, we'll left click on the image. And you'll have a window pop up. And you select open RGB image window, okay? So basically, a, an RGB image will be created with the VV band in the red channel, the VH band in the green channel, and the ratio of VV to VH in the blue channel. So we'll press OK. Okay, so there's your RGB image. And uh, you can see, I uh, appreciate different colors here, which represents the information in the different channels. So one thing that you can do is, if you want to see the pixel values, you go to the window up here, there's in the upper left, called Pixel Info. and if you move your cursor around the image, it'll give you the pixel value, which is this right here in amplitude and in intensity. Okay, so wherever you're moving it, actually, let's, let's go here. So wherever you're moving it, it'll give you the pixel value. Okay, so you, you can have a feel for what the values are just by moving your cursor around. All right, so next we'll talk about pre-processing. And in this case, since this image is quite large, it's one gigabyte, it might take a while to go through the processing steps in a, in a computer that's not very fast. So we will be subsetting the image. And so for, for that, we go up to the main menu, select raster, and then select the 
subset option. Okay. And what we'll do is I defined the subset on the PowerPoint chart. And so if you take a look at this box here, the spatial subset, I've defined the, the scene start in the X dimension and the C start in the Y dimension as well as the end. So if you specify these values, uh, specify the same values to uh, make sure we have, you have the same subset. So it's 1548 to 2236 in the X and Y, and then 15136 to 14964. And we say, OK. So if you go back to your product explorer, the next image here that's added onto the list is your subset. And one thing about the Sentinel toolbox is that it adds somewhere in the new name, it'll add what's been done. So here, this new image is called subset. So we'll just to keep things clean, we'll close this and then we'll open this up, bands, and let's just open up, that's our subset. Okay, so this is gonna make it much more uh, manageable uh, to work with. It's a, a much smaller image. The next couple of steps are going to uh, be focused on geometric and radiometric calibration. And the objective in performing these calibrations is to create an image where the value of each pixel is directly related to the backscatter of the surface. So we want to make sure that we correct for uh, any type of uh, calibration issues that are introduced because of relief or a displacement or because of antenna pattern calibrations issues. So this process is essential for analyzing images in a quantitative way and also important for comparing images from different sensors, modalities, processors, or acquired images acquired at different times. So, uh, so the first part in it, the pre-processing is to do the radiometric calibration. And for that, we'll go back to our Sentinel toolbox. And we select the image that has been subset. So whatever you're going to do is done on the last image that was added to your product explorer list. Okay, so we highlight, we, we make sure that we're running the next process on the subset by highlighting it. And then we go up to radar, radiometric, and we select calibrate. Okay, a window is gonna pop up that has two tabs and uh, leave everything as default. So we want the output in sigma naught and we want these input parameters. Uh, you can change the directory where you're saving your files. In this case, I'm just putting things on the desktop, but uh, you might want to create a special directory where you place your files. So you run this and it should be, depending on how fast your computer is, it can take a couple of seconds. Uh, like mine, or it could take a couple of minutes. Okay, so once it's done, it says process completed in 13 seconds, close, and then that calibrated image is the next one here on my list. So I'll open this, and one thing to note in the file name is that it keeps tagging on whatever is done to the image. So you see here it says subset, and if you go to the end of the file name, it tags on CAL, which means calibrated. So that's an easy way to keep tabs of uh, the uh, which image is which, you know, and what's been done to the images. So this is 
now our calibrated image. Okay? And what the radiometric calibration does is it corrects many different radiometric distortions due to the signal loss as it propagates, the non-uniform antenna pattern, differences in gain, um, saturation. So another part of uh, doing the pre-processing is actually speckle reduction. And we talked about speckle reduction in the first webinar. So speckle makes interpretation of the image uh, difficult because it's a, a graininess, salt and pepper effect that uh, corrupts the information about the surface. And it's very difficult to sometimes visually interpret the images and even more difficult to uh, do analysis on the image when you have a large amount of speckle. So there are two ways of reducing speckles. Uh, one is through speckle filters, and another one is by multi-looking the image. And we will use multi-look in this case. So the output from the previous step, which is this calibrated image, is here. Uh, we'll highlight it. And then we'll select radar. And we will go all the way to the bottom here and select the multi-looking option. And a window will pop up with two tabs again. One says uh, input output parameters, processing parameters. So go to the second tab. And then you specify the number of range looks and azimuth looks. So you should be the same. And let's specify six. Okay. So um, as had been discussed in the first webinar, uh, whenever you do multi-looking or if you use uh, speckle filters, spatial filtering, you reduce the resolution of your image. So the larger the number of looks, the more you reduce the resolution of the image. Uh, and the same goes with uh, speckle filters. So you run that, and then that new image is placed at the bottom of your product explorer window. It's the last one. So in this case, it's number four. And if we go to the end here, you'll see that ML is tagged onto the file name. That means it's multi-looked. So it's calibrated, and it's multi-looked. OK, so let's close this. and. And that's our new image. Tremendous difference. Tremendous difference between the image, the original image, which is this one, and then the, the cleaned image. Okay. And if you use a larger window, we used 6 by 6. But if you use 10 by 10, it will look even smoother. All right. So. The next step here is in doing a geometric calibration. Okay, so we've done, you first do the radiometric calibration, you do the multi looking or your filter, and if you wish to use filters, uh, here's where you would do that. So you go to radar and you do, you select speckle filtering, single product speckle filter. And then in the processing parameters, there are a number of different speckle filters that you can select from. Uh, the Lee filter is one of those, the most commonly used speckle filters. But you could try uh, many other ones here and determine for yourself which one works best. Uh, one important thing to specify is the window size. And so you, can, you have a whole a list of options of different window sizes. Obviously, the larger the window size, the more smoothing you do, and the more resolution you lose. Okay. So, well, uh, for this example, we'll stick to multi-looking, and the next step is geometric calibration. So we'll highlight the last, uh, the last image. 
that was generated. And then we'll go up to the main menu and we'll select radar. Uh, we'll select geometric and then we'll select terrain correction, range Doppler terrain correction. And what this does, it, it calibrates or it corrects for any sort of displacement from the terrain. And it needs a digital elevation model to do that. So if you go to the processing parameters tab, you'll have a number of different options here. And it says digital elevation model. So by default, it uses the SRTM three second, three arc second uh, DM. But you can specify other DMs uh, he, either here on the list, or if you have your own DM, you can specify that as well. So you hit run, and in this case, we're using the default. And we close this. The new image has the file name of the new image has TC tagged onto it, which stands for terrain correction. So we've calibrated the image multi-look terrain correction. Okay? And when you load the image, you can see that it's in a different orientation. So this is in its correct orientation now, following um, the river flows now in the correct direction. All right, so the next step is to convert sigma naught into dB. And this is really the way that we represent backscatter is in dB. It's a measure of power. And so the way you do that is you highlight uh, sigma naught either VH or VV. And then you uh, left click and a window pops up. And then you select the linear to or from DB option. So select that. You get a window saying we'd like to convert sigma naught VH into DB in a new virtual band. And you say, yes, I do. And then you do the same thing for VV so that we have both bands in DB. We say yes. And so these new bands, uh, it, DB bands are now tagged on here to the list. And so we double click, uh, we'll display the DB bands, BV and BH. And so one thing to note too is when you're, it's always really important to take a look at the images and just get a feel for the information content for each individual one and between them. So if you look at uh, the difference between BV and, and VH, the, the, there's some notable things in the patterns that you're seeing and the differences in tone uh, between VH and BV. So that gives you an idea of the difference in the information content between the different polarizations. So we'll, to have an idea of the different DB values, we'll go up to pixel info and we'll scroll around here, the image, and it gives us the intensity value right here. It's, it's not coming up because my cursor isn't over the image, but keep an eye here on sigma naught VH DB and sigma naught VV DB. As I move around the image, you'll get a sense for those DB values, right? And if I move the cursor over the water, it's quite low in uh, VH, it's minus 25.55 DB. In VV, it's minus 18.725 dB, so very low. And if we move on to an area that has a brighter tone, you can appreciate how much brighter that is on the order of minus 14 in VH and minus 8 in uh, VV. OK, so the next and last step here is to do a short analysis on, on the, this data set. 
So the first thing we'll do is to analyze the image histogram. So we'll do that uh, looking at the lower left window here. Uh, if you don't have a window that says color manipulation, then you want to bring it up by using going up to view, toolbars, tool windows, sorry, and select color manipulation here. And that will open up down on the bottom left, the window, this window here. Okay, so what this window contains is the histogram. And what we'll do is we'll identify the two peaks. Um, and so visually you can see here that we have two large peaks. Uh, one is the, the land cover and the other smaller peak here is the uh, water. And you can see that this peak is a little higher with a VH rather than VV. Okay. So we'll select the value that separates water from everything else. And so that would be, you, you can move this around and kind of select that value. And so we'll say that that value is right around there, 18.85. Okay, so we'll make note of that, minus 18.85 dB. And the next step is to create a threshold to separate water and land. Okay, and the way we'll do that is we'll go to raster, we'll select band math, and you'll have a window pop up. So you go to the bottom where it says edit expression right here. And so what we'll do is we'll follow, we'll input the expression that's specified on the PowerPoint file number 32, which is uh, file number 30, which is uh, this one right here. So we'll actually just copy that and we'll input it right here in this expression. And we'll press OK. Oops, it didn't like the copy and paste. So what we'll do is we'll select the image there and we say OK. And then we hit OK. And so it applies that band math, and it creates a new band here. It tacks it on, and that's called uh, new band 2. And this is the result. So basically, you have a binary image where 0 is, uh, where 1 is water, and 0 is everything else. And 1 is open water. And then in order to change these colors, you go to the color manipulation window on the bottom left and select table. Okay, so you got here the three colors in that image. And so we'll select green for black and we will select blue for white, and there you go. That's your open water, so you're assigning, and there's nothing, nothing there should be gray. Let's see, so we'll say, yeah. So that's your image, and then, and okay, so, and you can export it as a KMZ file by going into File, Export, selecting Other, and View as Google Earth KMC. So it will save it as a KMC file. And then you can open that. On Google Earth, there it is. In summary, uh, these are the steps that you need to do. First of all, 
uh, the data preparation. You acquire the images, uh, and sometimes these images cover a much larger area than perhaps your area of interest. Or you might need to subset it anyway because uh, your processing power is not uh, so fast. So it, it can be, uh, make it much more manageable if you subset the image and just work with chunks. So once you have that done, then you go through the pre-processing steps. Uh, you first do the radiometric calibration. Then you do the filter application to reduce speckle, whether it's multi-looking or whether you use some sort of spatial filter. And then finally, the last part that you do is the geometric calibration. And then you can start doing your processing of the image and data analysis. And here I just showed you a basic uh, example on how to threshold where we separate water from land. But you can um, uh, run whatever algorithm you want on the image, uh, whether it's uh, supervised or non-supervised. And the Sentinel toolbox has Op different options for classification. So if you go to raster and you select classification, it's got two categories, unsupervised or supervised, and it's got a number of different options under supervised, including random forest classifier, which is actually a very powerful approach. Uh, so I encourage you to uh, play around with these different options and determine for yourself which one gives you the best results. Uh, but I do suggest to start with random forest classifier. Of course, you'll have to go through the process of uh, doing the training and selecting areas uh, that uh, you know are uh, truly representative of your different classes. So with that, this concludes this second webinar series, and I'm open to your questions. Thank you. <laughs>